A note about statistics used this season on the fall line. In the period we discuss, 1978 to 1996, Grady Hospital was number one for infant abduction in the United States. This is confirmed in Nick Meck's report released in 2006, which covered most years pertinent to our cases. At the time of production, this report was the most up-to-date public material available on that specific ranking. Outside of the range, 1978 to 1996, another hospital may earn the designation of most kidnapped. All material relating to Grady's abductions refers to the years covered in the podcast. This is The Fall Line. I fought with myself for years with that question and to try to bring her back. Especially when she was, when I, I guess when it was first, when it first happened. Because I guess I didn't know what state of mind I was in. Um, for the baby shower, she had received uh, two baby bags and always kept it, one of them packed fully with formula and pampers and because I just knew they were coming to pick her up that week because I, I knew I wasn't no you know this is something I never did this was out of character and and I was going to get caught I knew it and I thought I was going to get caught that week and for I guess maybe good six months that bag stayed in the hallway closet because I knew somebody was going to knock on the, on the door and say, hey, we heard you got this baby. Give her back. So I wanted to make sure that she was going to be well, okay on her way back to Florida. And she would have diapers and formula? Yes. yes. Ultimately, that day didn't come until she was 18. That's correct. 1991. 23 people are killed in a bus crash in Brunswick, Georgia, where Monica and Michael Bennett had disappeared just two years before. The Atlanta Braves make the World Series. And in Atlanta, Georgia, a woman named Cherise Felder steals a baby from Grady Memorial Hospital's maternity ward waiting room. That baby, Christopher Lewis, is the child of LaRonda Arnold, who is there to visit her own mother. They're giving birth just a month apart. Cherise Felder offers to watch Christopher while LaRonda visits. And when she returns, Christopher and Cherise have vanished. Apparently, at the time, there was question of whether LaRonda was telling the truth, both that she had a baby and that he had been kidnapped. We're not sure if she was accused of foul play by media or by rumor, but Lieutenant Danny Agan was assigned to the case and was interviewed by the Atlanta Constitution on July 2, 1991. He is quoted as saying, quote, I believe LaRonda Arnold. Her baby has been stolen. We have questioned several witnesses, some of whom may have seen a woman leave the hospital. I mean on the outside of the hospital, with that tiny baby. It's emotional. And that's why we're asking anyone who has seen some young woman who has just suddenly turned up with the new baby to call us. Kidnapping is worse than a homicide where there is no hope. This is a lot more intense. You don't know the intentions of this kidnapper, and you have just a few hours to do something about it. The suspect, then unidentified, was described as a medium-complected black woman of around 18. She was about 5'3 and heavy set and wore light wash jeans and a brightly colored blouse. The story barely had time to hit local news. The woman's mother showed up at Grady the next day, her daughter Sharice in tow. She said they'd come to return the baby. Christopher Lewis had been missing for less than 24 hours. He was still dressed in the clothes he'd worn at his disappearance. A yellow set of pajamas and white booties with bells on the toes. The story rapidly filtered out of the news cycle, but not before a few guesses could be made as to why Cherise had taken the child. The Atlanta Constitution offered this quote from the APD, quote, 
She admitted she took the baby, but didn't really say why, Sergeant King told us. I guess she wanted a baby. At least that much seems obvious. Charisse took the baby home to her mother's house. But why? In July of 1991, Charisse was almost 20. She wasn't married and didn't have a live-in partner. She may have had a boyfriend, but there's no mention of that information anywhere. We cannot assume heterosexuality, though most of the women who abduct babies are romantically involved with men when they commit their crimes. They may feel pressure to keep a male partner through a child's birth or to produce a baby after an announced pregnancy that may or may not have at one time been real. They may even have lost a pregnancy. That is a common contributing factor. According to Gloria Williams, the woman who kidnapped Kamaya Mobley in 1998 and who you heard at the top of the episode, that was her reason. Her family had already prepared and thrown her a shower. She and her husband had painted a room in their home. She was actually driving around with a baby's car seat in the back of her car. One night, she got on the highway and began driving. She didn't stop until she reached a hospital in Florida. And Kamaya Mobley was missing until 2017. The major factor that separated Sharice Felder and Gloria Williams was the approach. Sharice, unable to make it onto the ward itself, just hung around the waiting room in the snack bar. She was disorganized. Even if she had made it onto the ward, she didn't display the level of preparedness we saw in Louise Lett, who brought an Avon bag large enough to fit a baby, or in Lisa Morris, who stalked Donna Green for a week before choosing to strike. Charisse's mother turned her in, but we suspect that if she hadn't, law enforcement would eventually have caught up with her. She was not a planner. By contrast, Gloria Williams made several strategic choices, which made her abduction of Kamaya Mobley so frighteningly successful. Gloria was able to seamlessly blend Kamaya into her family and to care with her with confidence. We spoke to Dr. Jenny Johnson, a forensic psychologist, about kidnappers and their motivations and possible mindsets. So these are people who, not always, but, but oftentimes, you know, are with it enough to be able to plan where to get a baby. Um, sometimes they may visit nurseries or ma uh, maternity units to get a lay of the land if they're stealing them from a maternity unit. Oftentimes they'll impersonate like nurse or healthcare professionals. They're, you know, with it enough to be able to make those plans, put those skills together to be able to impersonate staff at a hospital, for example. And a lot of the times these people can demonstrate some capability to provide for the baby once the abduction occurs, um, particularly those who are kidnapping the baby for their own personal gain, so for, for their own desire to care for a baby or to keep their partner there within their own, I guess, emotional capabilities, the fact that they were willing to steal a baby. But but yeah, so, that, so oftentimes people might think, oh, someone has to be crazy in order to do something like this. But these people can be relatively well-functioning in community while, you know, also being willing to do something like this. Gloria Williams' approach was common among organized hospital kidnappers. She acquired scrubs and she passed herself off as a healthcare worker. According to the medical journal article Offense Characteristics, the approaches vary, but that impersonation is most common and also hinges on the kidnapper's ability to seem professional, kind, and calm. And that bit is important because it's quite different from the outside the hospital kidnapping scenarios we see today where women are increasingly likely to use force, sometimes even physically attacking expectant mothers and forcefully removing preterm babies from the womb. Of the 199 non-family infant abductions that Nick Meck recorded between 83 and 2000, 30 were violent. Six of those involved forced C-sections performed by the perpetrator. When women attack other women outside of a medical setting, they're not concerned with quiet escapes. Sometimes they're not concerned with the mother's life and don't want to leave witnesses. In 2003, Nick Mech reported that one-third of home abductions included violence, and that number has been on the rise ever since. If abductors actually remove women to another location, their likelihood of survival lessens. The report includes a particularly disturbing illustration of this. And sensitive listeners may want to skip ahead for the next five minutes or so because we're going to include more detail of the kind of attacks that have occurred. Without including identifying details, Nick Mack described a kidnapper who, 
After forcing her victim into a car and driving her to a rural field, then performed a C-section with a set of car keys. This kind of brutality is difficult to imagine, but it's not the only example. You may have heard of cases like those of Tika Adams, who was in her third trimester when a woman named Veronica Deramus convinced her to come to her apartment. In December of 2009, Veronica offered Tika free baby gear, and Tika, who was temporarily homeless and desperate to prepare for her daughter's arrival, couldn't pass the offer up. The Washington Post describes how this went down. It seems that Veronica was actually stalking Tika and had been for some time. For days, she called Tika's phone, and when the pregnant woman finally answered, identified herself as a representative of a charity who helped mothers in need. She invited Tika to come by and pick up supplies. Tika, who was 29, had just gotten married, but she and her new husband were living apart. She in a residential home for expectant mothers and he in a treatment program. The Post reports Tika's recollection of that last conversation before she went to meet Veronica. Her husband, PJ, was uneasy with the idea. He told her, quote, don't get in a car with a stranger. He asked why Veronica couldn't bring the items to her. Tika told the Post that she dismissed his worries. She thought the woman sounded nice, very official, very professional. In an NBC interview, Tika describes visiting Veronica's Maryland apartment. Veronica was odd from the get-go, muttering and pacing as Tika nervously ate the lunch the woman had prepared. She was on guard but dismissed her feelings, right up until Veronica grabbed a fire poker from its stand and cracked it across Tika's skull. She beat Tika until the kitchen was splattered in blood, so much so that, according to Tika, Veronica became disturbed. Not by the violence, but by the mess. Tika told NBC, quote, She started cleaning the walls in her apartment, and she kept pacing the floor, talking about how she couldn't have blood in her house because her son was coming home, and she wouldn't know how to explain it to her son. And I'm hearing all this, but I'm just like laying there because I don't want her to kill me. Simple as that. Tika's ordeal was far from over. Over the next three days, Veronica locked her in a room in the apartment, bound her with duct tape, and shut the windows tight. It was so dim that, the Washington Post reports, Tika couldn't tell whether it was day or night. Veronica slept next to her on the floor, shifting between concern and anger. She continually played what the Post described as bootleg DVDs of popular movies like Precious, ostensibly to muffle any noises that Tika might make. On the day that she finally decided to attempt a home C-section, Veronica put in a recording of a Michael Jackson tour video. The Post reports that Tika was bound and gagged and that, with laughing tour dancers in the background, she watched Veronica approach her with a box cutter. Veronica sliced Tika's abdomen open, cutting through her uterus and bladder and she couldn't figure out how to remove the baby from Tika's womb. When Tika's moans became louder and louder, Veronica finally gave up. She eventually fell asleep on the floor next to her captive. When Tika managed to escape the apartment the next day, she begged a neighbor for help. Veronica was right on her trail, screaming about a misunderstanding and dragging Tika back toward the apartment. In answer, Tika showed the man what lay beneath her shirt, a bloody mess with her organs exposed. Unbelievably, Tika and her daughter, Miracle, survived the ordeal. Other women, though, were less lucky. Though a rare crime, fetal abductions are on the rise. Most of the recorded cases occurred after 2000, when hospital security measures had increased. Of those 20 cases, only four of the women and 11 of the infants survived. The deaths were brutal, and in the cases covered in the list, none remain unsolved. Most abductors were sentenced to life in prison, and one received the death penalty. One committed suicide after sentencing. Though the method of fetal abduction is starkly different, the demographic of the perpetrators still fits the basic profile laid out by NICMEC in 2003 when they analyzed hospital abductors. We asked Dr. Johnson whether there were any major differences in hospital abductors and those who abducted outside of hospitals, especially fetal abductions. No, I don't think the process 
if that makes sense, is any different. I think that perhaps because the access is even more limited, it's going to be harder to walk into someone's house and steal a baby. It's going to be harder to um, walk into a hospital and steal a baby. They're, they're unable to have those means, but the desperation is still there. And so perhaps that desperation goes on even longer than it might have if they'd had access. Racial demographics are interesting. In her study of non-familial infant abductions, Lisa Strollman explained, quote, Offenders are most frequently either Caucasian or African-American. When compared to the general population, though, African-American and Hispanic offenders are more heavily represented, end quote. NCMEC data bears this out. From 1965 till 2018, the numbers for African-American abductors hovers around 42%. Most non-familial abductions are intraracial, and 61% of the victims are Black or Hispanic. But abductors who kidnap outside of their own race are much more likely to be white. And now is a good time to tell you, there is an eighth Grady baby. We chose not to include him in the main narrative as he was not kidnapped from or because of his stay at the hospital. He also falls outside of the infant category as he was eight months old at the time of his abduction. Like all the other babies in our story, Elijah Evans is African-American. But unlike the other women, his kidnapper was white. She was also the only abductor to use force. In October of 1999, Elijah's mother, Natalie, took her son to Grady for treatment. He developed a sinus infection and needed antibiotics. She took a bus back to her southwest Atlanta neighborhood, and it was fairly late at night, and the streets were mostly empty. On her walk home from the bus stop, she was accosted by a 17-year-old who we've chosen to call Jennifer. Although her name was released to the media, we'll continue our plan of assigning pseudonyms to minors here. Jennifer had been on the bus with her, but Natalie hadn't paid her much attention. The girl around her own age was nondescript. Some news reports describe Jennifer as a stranger to Natalie, but others say she was actually a casual acquaintance, someone who had been staying in the neighborhood for a little while. Either way, Natalie had no reason to be afraid. But after the bus doors closed and the driver pulled away, Jennifer leveled a handgun on Natalie and demanded that she hand over Elijah. If Natalie didn't, she'd kill them both. Natalie froze. In that moment, Jennifer yanked Elijah from his mother's arms and then ran into the wooded lot that backed up onto the row of little houses. There was no one around to help. The few houses that were in the neighborhood were surrounded by vacant lots. Crime was high and Natalie was used to being careful, but her guard hadn't been up. Natalie ran. She was in her own house in moments. Once she managed to explain what had happened, her parents, Willie and Elizabeth Yarborough, called 911. We don't have reports of how APD handled this abduction, but we assume they started in the immediate area surrounding Natalie's home. In most cases, that would have been the best approach. Law enforcement couldn't have known that Jennifer had already fled to Tennessee. Jennifer was a native of a little town called Detchard, about 45 minutes from Chattanooga. An AJC article from the time of the kidnapping described it as an area mostly made up of highway exits and fast food restaurants. She'd been well-behaved as a preteen, but was described as getting wild around the age of 14. Local news reports included interviews with her softball coach, who described her as a typical teenager, but also noted she'd begun to get in trouble. According to the AJC, Jennifer had run away on multiple occasions and might have fled the Detroit area for Atlanta in order to avoid an arrest warrant. The article quotes Detroit police chief Summer as saying, quote, This kid's been running away since she was 14 years old. There was no discussion of what Jennifer might have been running from or what problems she faced. There was, however, room for a quote from her softball coach who said she was the only player on the team to wear makeup to practice. In Atlanta, she was using a fake name, Shanice Price, presumably to avoid notice by Tennessee law enforcement who may have been looking for her. We're not sure why Jennifer chose Atlanta, but a few clues concerning her motivation to kidnap Elijah have become apparent. It seems that, like many other abductors, Jennifer had at one time been pregnant. Her long-distance boyfriend still thought she was. Was she hiding out in Atlanta during the months when it would have been obvious that she was no longer pregnant? 
Whatever her reason, she kidnapped Elijah on a Wednesday evening. By Thursday night, she was back in Tennessee, claiming the eighth-month-old to be her own. It's hard to imagine that he could have been passed off as just a few weeks old. And that suspicion seems to have struck her own family. Jennifer was actually turned in by her aunt, who called Atlanta police to report her niece had arrived back in Tennessee with an infant too old to be the newborn she claimed him to be. The aunt hadn't heard of Elijah's case. News hadn't spread beyond Atlanta at that point, but police were easily able to match up the baby's description to missing Elijah Evans. By Saturday evening, Jennifer was in custody and in the process of being extradited to Atlanta, and Natalie and her family were in Dutchard. Elijah was being watched over by the staff of the city hall. Everyone had heard the story by then. Natalie and her family gave several interviews to local and national news media, thanking God and the two police forces for Elijah's safe return. The baby is described as being in good health despite a mild cold and a little cranky from teething, but otherwise fine. Jennifer was prosecuted for her crimes, serving time and then moving back to Tennessee, where she raised a family. Elijah grew up in Atlanta, and his mother is still here, too. The very last news reports quote police as saying that they don't know why Jennifer kidnapped Elijah. But based on NCMEC demographic studies, the answer is right in front of them. Jennifer matches many of the characteristics of the typical infant abductor. One in particular stands out. Nick Mac says that the kidnappers exhibit compulsive behavior and most often rely on manipulation, lying, and deception. Of the identified kidnappers we've discussed, at least four have faced charges of forgery. They've given false names to police and committed related crimes, with check forgery being the most common denominator. Bad checks are a close second. Louise Lett, Shantae's abductor, even managed a complex fraud involving airline tickets. Some of the abductors, like Jennifer, have used aliases. All in all, there seems to be a lot of pretending. Lots of being someone else. <laughs> 